separation hyperplane from the point and C. So that is, the, the oracle generates, say, A in Rm, such that Ay is less than or equal to Av for all B in C. Okay. So that's the description that we have of our set, and our, our mission is to find a point in the set. So let me give a couple of examples. In fact, the first example is going to be the main 
uh, the main example that I'm going to revisit a number of times in the talk. The first example is you know, the standard example in the, the standard linear programming uh, problem. If my set C is a polyhedron, so that is, the set C is a set of points in Rm such that uh, it is defined by finitely many inequalities. So here for i, 1 to n. Okay. And sometimes I'm going to write this as the set of points such that a transpose y is greater than or equal to b. Okay. Where a here is the matrix a1 up to a n. Okay. So that's the first example. And this corresponds to uh, linear programming, the linear programming feasibility problem. And another example is uh, if we look at the set of, say, vectors such that some combination here, yi, ai minus b, if this is, uh, so this means here positive semi-definite. And this is the semi-definite programming uh, context. So here, the ais and the bs are given symmetric matrices, and we're looking for a uh, combination of the ai so that this combination is positive semi-definite. Uh, at, at the time that I was a student here, semi-definite programming was an area that was absolutely uh, exploding at the time there were papers uh, coming around the truck. Uh, today, if I were going to make a, and, and uh, to, to try to find a topic that is uh, analogous in terms of popularity, it would be perhaps first order the methods, at least in complex optimization. So these are the two examples. <laughs> and what I want to do uh, in the remaining part of my talk is I want to tell you uh, a story about the story has two parts. I want to spend a few minutes talking about some classical algorithms. Uh, uh, at least one of those algorithms was invented long before many, many of you were born. So these algorithms are very old, and very from the early days of uh, optimization. And then I want to fast forward to some interesting developments that have happened in the last few years, certainly after all of us were born, and probably after all of us were already adults. Uh, so let me let me start with uh, some uh, a couple of classical algorithms. So let me move over here. And again, this is my problem. Okay, I, we want to solve the feasibility problem given an oracle. And I forgot to say, in the first case, if I'm given the uh, the matrix A and the vector B, if I'm given all the A, I, and B. Obviously, we have an oracle here, right? If I have a candidate point, I just verify the inequalities. And if uh, all of them hold, then I verify that Y is in C. If one of them is violated, then that one gives me the separating hypermet. Um, the second case is a little more complicated, uh, but it can also, there's also an oracle for this case. So let me talk about the first uh, algorithm. This is called the, separate, the relaxation method. Relaxation method. And again, this was before many of you were born. Probably at least half of the people in the room. So this was by Ackman and Motskin and Schoenberg in about 1954. And the idea of the separation, the relaxation method is. Uh, the following, we take, we consider this problem, we consider the problem as in, uh, so we consider, <laughs> there you go, <laughs> see, as in, you don't know how many of us just made happy. <laughs> <laughs> so let's consider C a polyhedron, okay? Some of us will run. <laughs> <laughs> so the algorithm is the following, so what that means is we have, is I'm going to draw this set. So we have C is defined by finitely many inequalities. Let's say that this is C. Okay. So the algorithm goes as follows. Let's say that I have a candidate point Y. Okay. Uh, I check my inequalities. It's not in there. Then we find one of the violated inequalities. Right. So we find one of these. Let's say this one. And then the idea of the algorithm is, well, we found this value inequality, let's move towards that inequality. And in principle, there are various points that we can move to. This seems like a very tempting point to move to right to the point where the inequality then is validated. 
or we could go a little past that. Okay, so maybe we can move a little there. So the algorithm will go as follows. We would begin, let's say, with zero. Uh, say that the init this is going to just indicate the index of my uh, iterate. And then, as long as there is a violated inequality, so as long as I have a violated inequality, what I'll do is update my uh, trial point. So I'll move from the current point, let's say that this is yt, and this is the inequality that is violated. So the yt plus 1 is going to be somewhere around here. So yt plus 1 would be somewhere around this direction. So the way of uh, writing that down would be yt plus 1 is going to be yt, and then I'm going to move in that direction. So to make it simple here, let's assume just so that the notation is a little bit simpler, I'm going to assume that the, uh, the vectors here, the inequalities, are normalized. So that way I don't have to, the, the lengths are uh, things that are easy to measure. So if I want to move right here, the point that gets me there would be, uh, I guess it would be bi minus ai yt ai. So that would be exactly this point. And if I want to move perhaps a little bit farther, then I can put a factor here, some lambda, let's say a little bit bigger than one. So that's the relaxation method, then update t. Uh, and then there was a theorem that Agmon proved. And the theorem is, if c is indeed non-empty, then uh, the, the algorithm generates a sequence that either terminates with a feasible point, or if it doesn't terminate, it converges to a point in C. So regardless, this would converge to a point in C if lambda is between 0 and 2. And then a related statement was proven by uh, uh, Motzkin and Schoenberg. And that is, if the interior of if the interior of C is non-empty, then yt actually is in C for t uh, sufficiently large. Okay, so the second one states that the algorithm actually terminates if the uh, if the set that we begin with is non-empty. All right. Need, uh Lambda bigger than one or something? Oh, sorry. Or lambda equals four three. lambda. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, that was four lambda equal to two. Thank you. Let's forget that important point. Yes, so that that is for lambda equal to two. Uh, now, the, there was another development that also happened in the 50s that uh, uh, actually was by someone here at Cornell at the time. So it's one of us. This was the perceptron algorithm. So let me describe this one. This is the perceptron algorithm. And this was uh, Rosenblatt in 1958. And he was working at the Corn this was called the Cornell Outer Nautical Laboratory that was here in at Cornell. Apparently that got removed from the campus because there was some issue about uh, universities doing uh, world-related uh, research that was highly criticized. So the lab, the lab now exists as another lab with a different name in um, Buffalo. Uh, but Rosenblatt, this was this has an interesting history. He was interested in the following problem. So he wanted to solve. So the problem is very related to the problem that I just described there. I erase this here, but let me write this again. We consider the homogeneous version of the problem. That is, the problem is uh, we take C to be the problem that we described before but now in homogeneous form. And then we want to find uh, some point in the interior of C. Okay? So this is a cone. Obviously, this has trivial solutions. So we want a solution that is not trivial. So let's look for a point in the interior of C that is we want to solve a transpose y positive. And the algorithm that Rosenblatt gave, oh, by the way, the, the, the problem that Rosenblatt was interested in solving is, was basically the first, one of the first, the, the precursors of uh, machine learning problems. The problem that Rosenblatt wanted to solve was 
we had a bunch of data points, positive observations and negative observations. And his problem was, of course, naturally, to find a separating hyperplane of the positive and the negative observations. So if you, the data here define a new problem or your observations, if you, you can rephrase the problem in homogeneous form as that of finding a solution to this. And the algorithm that he gave was the following. So the algorithm is as follows. Again, we begin with a, a initial point equal to zero, t equal to zero. And as long as we have a violated inequality here, I guess here, as long as there exists i such that a i y t is less than or equal to zero, then we update y. But the update that he proposed was just go one direction, <coughs> and one unit length um, vector in that direction. Uh, so that's, that was, that, this is called the perceptron algorithm. And there is an, kind of a nice uh, geometric property of this algorithm. This is something that is uh, closely related to some of the things that you mentioned that actually he and I worked on for when I was a student here. And that is, there is a certain kind of a geometric measure that tries to capture how well posed, how difficult this problem is. So let me try to describe what that is. So if we think about this set C, uh, here is a picture of how the set C could look like. So this is C. C could look like that, or C could look like this. Okay, so it's a cone. This is a cone that would have a very thin interior. This is a cone with a very thick interior. Intuitively, this problem should be easier to solve than this problem. So this should be a somewhat hard problem. This should be somewhat of an easier problem. So there is this um, uh, geometric measure called the width of the cone. And the width is just a measure of how thick this cone is. So the thickness can be associated to how big of a ball I can squeeze here. But of course, the ball, if I go far enough, I can squeeze an arbitrarily large ball if I have interior. So I would look at the largest ball that I can uh, squeeze in here that is centered at a point with norm 1. So this is the max of R such that uh, this is included in C. Okay, and the theorem that, uh, actually the theorem was not proven by Rosenberg, but it was proven by Bloch and Novikov a little bit later, is that the perceptron, so if the interior of C is non-empty, then the perceptron uh, finds a solution in at most 1 over tau c square iterations. Okay. Uh, so that was that is the perceptron, which we can see as a somewhat of a relaxation method. If you think about it, it's like the homogeneous version of the relaxation method. And this time we have something that is a little bit stronger than this. We actually have a statement of how fast the algorithm will uh, find a solution. Uh, so to, to give you one more piece of uh, a classical uh, algorithm, again, before many of us in the room were born, not me, but some of you, mm -hmm. I want to mention uh, another algorithm that is kind of a, an absolutely fundamental theoretical tool in uh, optimization, and that is the ellipsoid algorithm. Uh, so before I mention the ellipsoid algorithm, I would like to note something. Both the relaxation method and the perceptron algorithm, that is basically a special case of this, you can think about this as some, some sort of like, um, to make an analogy with uh, uh, statistics, with statistical inference, these are like point estimates. We are trying to find a point in our set, and we are looking for points. Okay? The ellipsoid algorithm, and again, in analogy, we can think about the ellipsoid algorithm as trying to get to the set C in a way, in a, by, by means of a confidence region. So instead of just finding a point, we are going to try to search for the set via regions. So here's how the ellipsoid algorithm works. So 
the ellipsoid. <coughs> I was trying to, uh, I was talking to Mike Todd earlier today and trying to make sure that I get my references here right. So the ellipsoid algorithm, uh, this was due to Shore and also Nemirovsky. And, within, and this was around the early 70s. So uh, still some of the people in the room. Oh, it's actually early. Okay. So it's good the mic is here. So 60 something. No, no, 76. Oh, 76. Okay, sorry. So. Okay, I got that wrong. I thought it was 72. Okay. Now, the Ellipsoid algorithm, as I said, it, it's, you can think about it as a, as a uh, search algorithm that it is searching not point, point wise, but instead of that, in terms of regions. So the idea is suppose that we have our set C is included in some initial ellipsoid ET. So we have an ellipsoid ET with a certain center YT, and then our set is somewhere around here. So this is our set C. So the idea of the ellipsoid is if, if the center is not in C, then what we can do is uh, find a separation hyperplane and then squeeze another smaller ellipsoid here, and this would be, so this would be ET, this would be ET plus one. So the algorithm is as follows. The algorithm will begin with a uh, set an initial ellipsoid E0 containing C, and then again the initial T will be equal to zero. And while the center of this ellipsoid, so this is, we're going to assume that the center is white. So while the center of this ellipsoid, of the current ellipsoid, is not in C, what we will do is take ET plus one to be the minimum volume ellipsoid containing uh, ET intersected with this. So again, we are here at YT. We found a separating hyperplane. So think about this separating hyperplane as this direction here is A plus one, the minimum volume ellipsoid that contains this half of this previous ellipsoid. And this can be computed. And then we update. Okay. And then the key, uh, the key uh, observation here, the key lemma is that the volume of the next ellipsoid divided by the volume of the previous ellipsoid is uh, less than or equal to e to the minus 1 over 2m plus 1. And then as a consequence of this, the theorem that Nemirovsky and Newton proved was is that if we know, so if we start by, if at the very beginning we can come up with a, an ellipsoid that contains C, so if we know some initial ellipsoid that contains our set C, and that exists and the set C has an empty interior, that is, there exists a ball that is included in C. Then the ellipsoid, the ellipsoid algorithm finds a point in C in this many iterations. So the ellipsoid algorithm finds Y in C in O of M squared log of, uh, oh, we put this this way. Let me do this a little bit better. I said that we know the initial ellipsoid is a ball of radius theta r, big r over little r. Okay. Now, if we think about our problem, say in conic form, our problem in conic form. So, if we have our set, if the problem is in homogeneous form, conic form, if we have a cone, we can always restrict ourselves to the ball of radius one. And then we could apply the ellipsoid here. So 
we can rephrase the theorem if we want to compare it to the, uh, the perceptron. We can rephrase this theorem as follows. So I guess a corollary of this is if, uh, if, say, if C is a cone and the interior of C is non-empty, then the ellipsoid finds y in C in O m squared log of 1 over tau C uh, steps. Okay. So there is a big difference between, uh, of course, the perceptron and the ellipsoid, right? The perceptron depends on, on the thickness of the cone as 1 over tau squared. The ellipsoid, by contrast, depends on the thickness of the cone as log of 1 over tau. So the, the dependence on that geometric measure of the cone is exponentially superior for the ellipsoid than uh, to the perceptron. So historically, we think about the uh, ellipsoid as an efficient algorithm for convex optimization. If somehow the particular elements that we have here, if the a's, if the entries of a are integer and so on, we can even bound that tau in terms of the bit, le bit length of the entries of a, and then in the in that kind of uh, measure, this is uh, considered to be efficient, but this is considered to be inefficient. Uh, so this is as much as I want to say about these classical algorithms. What I want to do is now fast forward to our lifetime. And I want to tell you about uh, two interesting developments that have happened in the last 10 years. Uh, and the two developments have to do with an effort to uh, do something to the perceptron algorithm that somehow uh, brings it in a way that is compatible to the ellipsoid algorithm. Uh, I should say that the, in spite of the uh, say disadvantage in terms of the dependence on tau, the ellipsoid algorithm remains, has remained very popular, especially in the machine learning community, because there are some advantages of the algorithm. The, even the convergence itself, as you can see from here, it depends on tau in a much worse manner. But then there is no dependence in the dimension of the problem. So in principle, if we want to solve a problem that is very high dimensional, uh, if the cone is thick enough, then in principle, this would work well. The perceptron algorithm is also related to two families of algorithms in machine learning that are very, um, very popular or have been popular at some different times. Uh, something called the uh, back propagation algorithm to train neural networks. And more recently, uh, there is a version, something that looks a lot like the perceptron algorithm called the Pegasus algorithm. It's an algorithm for support vector machines. Support vector machines are basically the, the modern way of thinking about separation. So it's, it's, it's the way of thinking about what Rosenblatt was thinking about 50 years ago, but with modern eyes. Uh, so what I want to say next is, again, I want to fast forward uh, about 50 years, well, no, 30 years since the ellipsoid. I want to talk about some modern developments. So I want to keep this here because I think this is going to come in handy. Uh, but again, I want, I want all of us to keep in mind this exponential difference between uh, the dependence on that um, thickness of the cone between this statement and this statement. Okay. So let me talk about what I would like to call some modern developments. So, or some more recent developments. And uh, this is something called the rescaled perceptron algorithm. And this was by Donagan and Vempala in 2004. Okay. Well, nobody was born after 2004. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So 2004. And uh, the idea of the algorithm is the following. So, well, if you look at this, and if the depend what, this, what makes this bad, say, is if tau is small, if the cone is too thin, the perceptron is going to be slow. So the idea is, well, could we somehow, say, try to solve the problem, and if we don't solve it, 
in a certain number of iterations, then that means that we know the cone is bad, it's thin. Can we try to stretch things in some direction to make that cone now five? And that's exactly what these guys did. So the key observation is the following. This is, um, so let's think about our cone this way, right? And uh, here is tau. So let's call z, z is going to be the center of the cone. So that is, uh, z is in c, and the z has no one. And the ball of radius uh, tau c is included in c. Okay, so z is the point that maximizes this here. So here's a neat observation that uh, I'm going to have a pull up main. Um, so let me make sure that I get the observation correct. So the observation is uh, if V is, it has norm one, and it's such that two conditions happen, uh, CB is greater than or equal to one over square root of M. The second condition is AIB is greater than or equal to negative one over 32m. So if those things, two things happen, then uh, what that means is if those two things happen, then Z should be, so, uh, V should be kind of sort of aligned in this direction so that if I, if I uh, train, so Z, uh, V would look sort of like this. So if I shrink in this direction, I will make the C not five. So the statement is, if these two things happen, I guess this has happened for all I. If these two conditions hold, then if we dilate in the direction Z, or more precisely, if we shrink in the direction V, so if we take, say, C hat equal to one minus one half, B, B transpose uh, C. If we do that, then the tau of C hat is greater than or equal to 1 plus 1 over 3 M tau of C. Okay? So, uh, right. So again, what this is saying is if I could get somewhat not too far off from the center of the cone, and I ensure that none of the inequalities is uh, grossly violated. If I can ensure that, then I can rescale in that direction and then improve my tau c. Okay. Uh, now, since the dependence on tau is like this, if you can do that every now and then, that will improve the, um, the speed of convergence of my algorithm. So now, of course, if I want to somehow incorporate this in my algorithm, we have a problem, right? Uh, I do not know Z, that's, that's more difficult than the problem that I want to solve. So how could I possibly uh, aim for this? This seems like asking much more of my algorithm. Uh, so what Don Agana Pempala suggested was something that I think is a really clever idea, is sometimes when you don't know what to do, then you just do something random. And randomizing seems to help you often. So uh, they proposed this. They call this the perceptron improvement. Perceptron improvement, which is the following. We take an initial point. Now, unlike the perceptron, we don't take the initial point to be zero, but instead we take an initial point to be random, say, of norm one. So this is going to be the, the, the sphere of norm one. So this is y in our m such that y is equal to 1. Okay. So we take this random, so uniformly at random. And then take, again, t equal to 0. And then do something very similar to the uh, perceptron. So while we have an inequality that violates, that this yt violates, While that happens, then we update yt. So we update yt plus 1 as uh, yt, and then we subtract 
A Y T K I. So T equals T plus one and and the key lemma is that with positive probability, so with probability at least one eighth uh, after This is 32 m square log m steps. We get that the d this satisfies one and two. Okay, satisfies these two conditions. So. Again, how do we ensure these two conditions? Well, we just do some randomization and we do something like the perceptron, this perceptron improvement. That guarantees that we do this. So that's less than minus one of the two, right? Uh, so the, oh, thank you, Mike. Yes, of course, this is less, 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 less. Again, if this is violated, this is violated by, 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 by more than that. So if there is less, then we keep going with this. And then, with that, equipped with that lemma, they can prove the following theorem. With high probability, so I guess, uh, I guess before seeing the theorem, let me state what the algorithm is. So the algorithm is, so let, me, let me put it here. So this is the rescale perceptron. It has three phases. So we run the perceptron up to, say, 32m squared times. Okay. Run the perceptron improvement up to uh, 32m squared log m steps. And then rescale A. So what does rescaling A mean? We want to rescale A so that this happens. So what that means is we set A to be, uh, we want to do the opposite of that. So we set A to be this, B, B transpose A. And then go back to 1. And then the theorem that they uh, could prove is with high probability, we can find that so this algorithm, the rescale perceptron, will find uh, y in the interior of C in at most O of m log of 1 over tau C. Uh, rescaling steps. Okay, so what that means is I will have to go through this three-step loop at most these many steps. And now each one requires each one requires about m square log m perceptron steps. So what that means is if we do now the uh, rescale perceptron, then we get uh, an improvement that is from 1 over tau c squared to log of 1 over tau, right? And then we have an m here, another m here in terms of the perceptron steps. So it's, it's an exponential improvement in, in the dependence on tau. Uh, now, I was very intrigued by this, and this really was very interesting to me because of this idea of how we can take Again, a problem that uh, we detect is difficult is the cone is too thin and we can make it farther. Right? This is what this lemma gets us. But there is something about this that I, maybe it's my particular bias, something that I still found a little bit maybe dissatisfying is the fact that well, we have to do some randomization here. right? So uh, I want to tell you something that my student and I did uh, over the last few months that is very much inspired by this. Uh, and again, it's, it, we, it gets us a very similar type of improvement. That is, we can improve the dependence of the 
of the perceptron from 1 over tau squared to log of 1 over tau. So let me tell you that because it's an idea that is somewhat complementary to this idea, and it gets rid of the um, randomization. So uh, let, me, um, let me try to squeeze it. Uh, let's see. Let me put it here. Okay. So I'm going to replace. This is the. Let me call this the randomized free scale. randomized because this initial step has to be random so that we ensure this and this is then uh, random the final statement first with high probability so what I want to tell you about now is some deterministic rescale and this was something that uh, my student and I just did in the last few months let me, let me tell you what that is so this is Sohili and me, and this is like 2012, 2013. Uh, I don't know, if I hadn't been invited here, maybe that's, this wouldn't have happened. So, uh, so the idea is the following. Uh, the key observation is this. Uh, so the key observation is the following. Again, the observation is very similar to the observation that I was describing earlier. If I perform this a certain number of steps and have not found a solution, not have found a solution, uh, then that means that that cone, that feasible cone, has to be thin. But actually, we can say a little bit more. So this is the key observation. If we have, if we run the perceptron, say six m n square steps and have not found, so we have not solved uh, our problem, then uh, we can identify, we can identify some particular column of A such that uh, our feasible cone, so this is the solution of our inequality, this is contained in the following set. So if we, if we run the perceptron for a certain number of steps, again, we know that this is thin. But actually, we can say more. We know that this is thin, and we can get an idea of how thin it is in a particular direction. This is going to be included in the set of points such that 0 is less than or equal to a i y less than or equal to uh, norm of y over square root of 6m. So what this means is if we run the perceptron for 6mn square steps and we have not stopped, then observe what the perceptron does at each step. It updates with one of the columns of A. So what we are going to do, if we look at the column that is most frequently visited here, that column gives me a good deal of information. It tells me that the feasible cone is almost perpendicular to that column. So what this means, the picture that goes with this is, here is our particular column AI, the one that I have used most often to update my um, trial solution. And then the cone, I'm going to use a little bit of color here since we have these nice color markers. The cone has to be in some kind of area here. So the cone has to be squeezed somehow there. So it doesn't have much room to go, but either here or here. But if we want to do a more interesting three-dimensional picture, if we have AI here, uh, and we look at the somehow the sphere, if we intersect with the sphere, the cone has to be in some kind of segment of that sphere. So the cone would have to be there. Uh, so this picture I find a little bit easier to draw. So if this happens, then this immediately suggests how we can improve the thickness of, of our cone. What we can do is now dilate, so now dilate along AI. So if we dilate along AI, then this should improve, make our cone fine. Okay? And that's this lemma. The lemma is, let me call this condition, condition star. So the lemma is uh, if 
AI satisfies this condition star, then uh, if we dilate along AI, okay, so if we, if we take uh, C to be identity plus AI, AI transpose C, this is C hat, then if we do that, then the tau, uh, but there's a little, um, a little caveat here. I cannot say, I, I do not know yet how we can argue about the tau, but we can argue about something that is related to tau. If this happens, then the volume of C hat intersected with the sphere, this is going to be at least three halves the volume of C intersected with this sphere. Okay? So that means the, the cone, after we do this dilation, the cone is going to get thicker. Okay? I may not know exactly that the tau gets bigger, but the, uh, the thickness of the cone, certainly, uh, the volume of the cone, if we look at that intersected with the sphere, that is going to increase by a factor. Okay? Uh, and then, what we can do is basically improve, uh, so tweak this, so this is, I like to call this the deterministic rescale. The deterministic rescale uh, perceptron. So we run the perceptron now, uh, not 32m squared times, but we run it, say, Uh, six, six m n square steps. Okay, and then if we didn't solve, if we did not find y in in C, then identify a i such that uh, star holds, and then we rescale. So now we rescale, which means we want to dilate C like this. So if we want to rescale A, we have to rescale the opposite way. We do I minus one half AI, AI transpose A. And then we go back to one. Okay. And now the theorem that we get is similar to this. So this was the theorem for, this was for the, this was for Randomized rescale. This was randomized rescale. So for the deterministic rescale, we get a similar theorem. So the theorem is uh, the, so this is the deterministic rescale. Uh, finds y in the interior of C in at most the same number of uh, rescaling steps. And then each of them requires uh, m squared n perceptron steps. Uh, sorry, mn squared, thank you. Like, mn squared steps, yes. Uh, so if we were to compare this with this, uh, so the advantage of this is that we have now deterministic, we don't have to worry about that extra um, perceptron improvement. But then we pay a little price, right? We have to do now mn squared as opposed to m squared log n. So um, there's that trade-off. But then there is something else that I have not mentioned so far. The perceptron algorithm, the way that I described it here, uh, it appears to apply only to a polyhedral cone, but in fact, the exact same algorithm would apply to any convex cone, provided that we have a separating hydroplane, a separating um, separation oracle. So if we have a separation oracle, we just have to invoke a separating a hydroplane here, and that would work. So this works, let me put this in a different color, this extends. This here extends to, to general 
uh, convex cone C. Likewise, this extends to general convex cone C. So this also extends, this too. The randomized rescale, this also extends a little bit. Uh, this also extends, but not to a general convex cone. There is some interesting work by uh, Veloni, Freund, and Pempala from like, 2009, where they show that you could push this a little bit further, the randomized rescale. But then uh, there is some, some nuances in the uh, perceptron improvement that make the algorithm much more restricted and much more complicated. Uh, so it's, it's not clear that this extends in a straightforward fashion to any kind of uh, convex cone. Uh, so that's that. Uh, I had one more thing to, that I wanted to mention about uh, this uh, separation-based algorithms. Maybe I'll conclude with the following. So uh, the last thing that I want to mention is, let me do this. This is a connection with uh, connection with first order methods. So this is a this is a type of algorithm. So first order methods are the kinds of algorithms, some of the most popular types of algorithms for convex optimization uh, today. These are the kinds of algorithms that people use in for solving these gigantic optimization problems in uh, compressive sensing, or many, uh, again, gigantic regression problems in uh, machine learning. And the idea of a first order scheme is, so a first order scheme, uh, so first order scheme works as follows. We take our iterate is, we take the current iterate, we take some kind of step length, and then a subgradient. So we assume here, so we assume that f is convex with a first order oracle. So a first order oracle means if we query a point, we can get the value of the function and a subgradient at that point. So a first order scheme is something like this. Uh, and then the, uh, a first order scheme with dilation. And this is something that you can trace back to Shore back in the 60s or 70s, is the idea that you can tweak the first order scheme by putting some kind of matrix here that you update uh, at each iteration. So the perceptron basically is closely related to a first order scheme. Uh, I'm going to skip the details of how this works, but essentially the perceptron is like a first order scheme. And then the rescale perceptron, rescale perceptron, and the ellipsoid, both, basically both of them can be seen as a first order scheme with dilation. So uh, I find this to be really interesting that, uh, well, in principle, what we are doing here is proceeding in a very geometric fashion. You can also think about that as a way of just thinking in terms of first order methods and first order methods where what we are doing is including some kind of uh, variable changing term here. It's like a change of inner product that we update at each iteration. Uh, I think my time is up, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. when you said you could um, extend your deterministic rescale perceptron to the case of a general cone because of that n there, right? N. Oh, yeah, yeah, so let me explain how, uh, and thank you for asking that question. Yeah, yeah, you would say, you would think, well, how, how are you going to do that? So that's, that's a great point. When I say here, I say that if you, if you run the perceptron, right, so let me just quickly recap where the perceptron, so the main step in the perceptron is this step, right? So if we have a violated inequality, so if this is less than or equal to zero, then we update like this. Okay. 
And then I said, what you have to do to identify this vector is look at the uh, column that you have visited most often. And that's why I have to take n squared, because uh, the n, I am visiting one out of n uh, vectors, right? So I, I need to check which one I visit most often. So that's the n squared. So if I want to do this for general cone, uh, well, Mike is as usual, very quick and sharp. If I want to do that for a general cone, it's like if n was equal to infinity, right? n could be infinitely many uh, inequalities. So how can I get around that? Well, the answer is, uh, if I want to do that for a general cone, what I have to do is, I would generate a different separating hyperplane here, but then out of infinitely many. But then there are only m uh, dimensions. So after a while, they start aligning up. They're getting aligned. So instead, what I can do is correct this and change this to uh, something like 6 uh, m to the 4. So in fact, the, the 6 m to the 4 would work in this case also. But it's that the m n squared is very intuitive because you, you clearly see that one of these vectors is the same vector is visited uh, frequently enough. If you have infinitely many, then it's not the same vector that gets visited, but uh, a set of sufficiently many vectors that are sort of aligned, they give you a direction that does the trick. Okay. Yeah, thank you.